Welcome back. I'm Russ Altman with Rob Reich. We're in the fourth session of the uh, AI and COVID-19 conference. Uh, we hope you've been enjoying it. This is going to be session four, treatments and vaccines. A couple of bookkeeping notes first, however. First, I want to remind you that there's a Q&A facility on the conference page where you can join the conversation and put questions, and our crack team will be uh, gathering them and sending them to Rob and me. Secondly, there's been a lot of questions about the availability of the older videos in the entire conference, and the answer is yes. These will be available soon for uh, re-watching or catching things that you missed. Uh, it'll just be a matter of our technical team bundling the video and making it available. But yes, the entire proceedings of this conference will be available long-term for uh, asynchronous watching at your leisure. So with that, uh, I want to welcome you to the session four, and we'll go to our first speaker, who is Kristen Beck. Kristen is the lead bioinformatician uh, at AI and cognitive software at IBM. And she'll be talking about rapid analysis of SARS-CoV-2 genomic content using a functional genomics platform. I want to begin, of course, by thanking the organizers of this um, amazing conference. I think it's so uh, excellent to be able to bring people together and share information for researchers and scientists. And I know to the general population and all those families in their living room that are watching this as well. So a huge thank you for that um, and the introduction as well. My name is Kristen Beck. I'm the lead bioinformatician um, for AI and cognitive software. I hail from the IBM Almaden Research Lab. So IBM Research um, is a place where we get to do kind of some really neat and crazy and inspiring things. Um, and, and our goal really is also to help make the world a better place. And so what I'm gonna share with you today is some of the research that we've done over the last several weeks in response to COVID-19 um, in an effort to help and to help provide our expertise in genomics um, and capabilities for the research community. So one of the things that we've observed over the last several weeks is that um, as the virus itself has been spreading rapidly, the amount of available sequence data is also growing in a, in a at a very fast rate. Um, this data was pulled um, as of yesterday, um, looking at the total amount of sequence deposited over time, and we're seeing thousands of available sequence data. Um, this magnitude of data, um, as well as the rapid rate with which it is created, indicates that applications to process that data must keep pace. Um, and in order to do that, they must scale in an automated way in a way that brings um, important points of that data together. On the right-hand side is a, a plot generated through the Next Strain platform um, with great acknowledgement to their work at this time, um, indicating from them and other researchers that we see that this virus is mutating typically about twice per month. Um, and that in itself will re reveal previously unseen variants. So the amount of data is growing, the virus itself is changing, and that really forces um, a, a unique computational time. The viral genomic sequence itself, this contains the molecular targets that are going to be used to develop antivirals, vaccines, and rapid diagnostic tests. So those sub-regions of this genome and the diversity that they have are what will actually be able to um, help us slow and kill this virus. Um, for the last several years um, through IBM Research, we've been working on a platform um, that was formerly called Omicsquare. It's now called the Functional Genomics Platform, and its roots originated in bacterial genome analysis, um, really to support the microbiome. Uh, the repository itself has been a collection of over um, 200,000 bacterial genomes. And then beyond their genomes, we've annotated the phenotypes, so annotating all of their genes, the proteins and functional domains. And together that data collection delivers the biological activity that the system could have. We put this together in a way that's a bit of a paradigm shift from how traditional bioinformatics is being done. So instead of having um, butt files on disk, we put this into a structured relational database. And what that allows is that these data types are um, connected automatically through the ingestion and processing that we do, such that you can observe a functional domain that does a specific enzymatic activity, map that back to its genome of origin, and go beyond that. The data itself is surfaced through a web browser, but also a developer toolkit that includes the Python SDK, Docker container, and REST APIs. And really over the last um, several weeks when um, the, the global pandemic became 
I mean, just, I don't even know, paramount size, really, I think it would cut a lot of our attention in a much bigger way than it had, unfortunately, at this point. Um, we shifted in what we were doing, and we said, how can we come together and how can we help in this nature? And um, to that extent, we um, wanted to look at the COVID-19 genomic information that was available. And so we brought a task force together, I think it was on a Tuesday, um, and the next day we had a corpus of genomes, uh, about 100 at the time, and I passed that over to uh, the lead architect of our system, um, Ed Siebold. And by the time we were drinking coffee the next morning, we had analyzed all the genes, proteins, and functional domains. And not only did we have the data, but it was easy to get to, queryable, and structured. That in itself, this data is what's going to comprise all these molecular targets for health interventions to be able to slow and kill the virus. Since that point, we realized how tremendous this capability is and expanded this even further. So since that point, we've processed over 25,000 viral genomes from GenBank and GISAD, which are uh, tremendous um, aggregates of data of this type including SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 genomes, as well as SARS and MERS genomes, um, which provides a comparative capability when to look at other outbreaks. Um, as part of uh, this capability in this platform, IBM is actually offering this cloud-based capability to researchers who are also working on COVID-19. Um, they can request access at ibm.biz slash functional genomics. Um, and we hope that by providing this data, we'll be able to accelerate researchers um, and also provide an excellent set of data to build AI and machine and deep learning applications on top of this. To give you just a peek of what data we already have in the system, um, on the left-hand side here is the total counts of data for different biological entities. For example, the genomes, genes, proteins, and domains of the viral data, all of our virus corpus. On the right-hand side is the specific counts for SARS-CoV-2. You can see we have over 3,100 genomes to date. This was pulled live this morning. Um, 3,000 genes and 2,600 pro proteins and 4,300 domains. And at the same time, what we're able to do by looking at data of this magnitude in a structured manner as it is, we can start to look at the emerging variants. So on the left-hand side, you have a contrast of gene um, distinct counts, the unique uh, count of sequences, as well as the redundant counts. Um, so that gives you the distribution of variants that we're already seeing emerge in the population of these genomes. On the right-hand side, I've contrasted for specific uh, proteins, the total count of distinct proteins, and then also um, the redundant count. So you can see, for example, that replicates polyprotein 1A um, has an increased amount of variance compared to replicates, replicates polyprotein 1AB. Um, for, mm -hmm. for spike glycoprotein, which is involved in host cell invasion, at the same time, you see hundreds of variants um, the collection of these variants itself is crucial as we think about building um, antivirals, vaccines, et cetera, because the um, affinity and the specificity for these molecular interactions um, will be keen to their um, uh, effectiveness. Um, on the bottom is a enriched motif that we're starting to observe in the spike glycoprotein and, and show just a little bit of a snippet as to what we can actually provide. Um, I'll take. Uh, I'll go ahead and wrap with that. Um, just to uh, invite you to come and access the data and to collaborate with us and to um, be able to provide this collection of data for the research community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kristen, uh, for for that overview of the genomic analysis. Our next speaker is Anthony Goldblum. Uh, Anthony is founder and CEO of Kaggle. Uh, and he will be speaking about the COVID-19 machine learning challenges. Hi, everyone. I'm Anthony Goldblum, CEO of Kaggle. Um, for those of you who don't know us, um, we are the world's largest machine learning community. Uh, we have a little bit over uh, 4 million members um, and we're best known for running machine learning challenges, uh, but we also are, uh, offer a place for data scientists and machine learners to share data sets um, and also to share reproducible notebooks or reproducible code. Um, like a lot of teams or a lot of people at the moment, we were interested in ways that we could contribute to COVID-19 um, and uh, Two and a half weeks ago, um, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy uh, approached us with the challenge that they wanted to put out in, our, in front of our community, and that's how we uh, first got involved. Um, right now, we have three challenges uh, running. Oops, uh, three challenges. Um, 
One is uh, an automate an NLP challenge, which is an automated literature review. The second is a forecasting challenge, um, uh, forecasting cases and fatalities, and the third is a data search challenge. So creating curating useful data sets. Uh, I'm going to go through each of these challenges, um, give you a sense for what's involved, what they require, as well as uh, what the kinds of things that we're seeing out of them. Um, so the first one is this uh, NLP challenge, which um, was the one that the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy uh, asked us to launch. What they had done is they um, uh, encouraged the journals to open access uh, the, the history of um, articles they have they have published on uh, coronaviruses um, and then more modern articles on COVID-19 specifically, and also to release them in a machine-readable form. Um, one of the challenges is that the literature on COVID-19 is moving very, very quickly, and it's very difficult for somebody to, ki to get their arms across all of the literature. Um, and so the goal here is, the, the way I like to position it is it's, it's, it's like trying to create an automated literature review that each week as new papers come in, the data set is getting updated um, and we're uh, uh, creating a pie, the, the machine learners in our community sort of answering key questions about COVID-19 by scanning the, those papers and in, 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 so in doing that, creating uh, sort of like an automated literature review. Um, if we look at the kinds of um, approaches uh, that people are taking, um, um, this is an, an example of a system. It's uh, it's not animating, but what the way it works is uh, somebody types in a question and it pulls out all the 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 best answers uh, to that question. Um, other people are taking more traditional approaches. So um, uh, you know, looking if, if we're trying to find all the papers that reference a reproduction rate or the reproduction number, um, doing string matches, uh, looking for the papers that have that term, and then trying to extract the data out of those papers. Um, and what we are doing is we are putting um, uh, the, the best of what the Kaggle community is coming up with on a website. Um, uh, uh, it's listed here at the bottom, www.kaggle.com, COVID-19-contributions. Um, and the, the, uh, the aim here is for this to be a resource that people can come to to have a sense for what the scientific literature is saying at any point in time. Uh, our second challenge is a more traditional Kaggle challenge. It's a forecasting challenge. And here we're asking our community to forecast uh, cases and fatalities by city. Now, the goal here actually isn't to build um, another epidemiology, epidemiological model. Uh, we heard from Ryan uh, at CMU earlier today. There are lots of good epidemiological models out there. Um, actually, the reason we are launched, we have launched this challenge is to um, encourage our community to, to play with the data and, and try and pick apart the factors that are driving differences in transmission rates across cities. Um, so this challenge is much newer. Uh, the the, the uh, NLP challenge launched a little over two weeks ago. This one's around a week old, um, and so the models aren't quite as mature. Um, but some of the early things, this is a, an, a very common output from a lot of the models that are being built here. It's what's called a feature importance plot. And it's interesting because this is giving us a sense for what the, the machine learning models are finding are the most predictive, most, are most predictive of uh, fatalities and cases. Um, at the model, at, at the moment, the models are fairly. This model, this is one of the better performing models. You can see it's a very simple model. Um, the most important variable is a time series variable, day, days from the first case. But it's also picking up that um, country, state, latitude, and longitude uh, make a difference. Um, obviously, there's nothing about the fact that you know it, it's not the country that is the reason that transmission rates are different in different countries, but rather it's the policies uh, in the, that country, or it's the um, um, the, the cultural norms around hugging and kissing or it's the temperature. And so we expect that as, as people iterate on their models, they'll bring in more granular data sets and we'll start to see much more interesting, these variable importance plots becoming much more interesting and starting to sort of pick apart the, the most important f factors uh, that are driving differences in transmission rates across different cities. Uh, so this is one to watch. Um, the last challenge uh, that we're hosting is a uh, data set curation challenge. So our community, as well as build, being very good at building natural language models and forecasting models, and they're also very good at um, playing with data sets and curating data sets. You know, very often it's not so simple to join two data sets together. You've got um, geolocation challenges or you've got, uh, you know, you don't have good join keys between different data sets. You have to do fuzzy matching. Um, and so um, we've asked our, challenged our community to 
put together um, data sets that are useful for making decisions about the pandemic. Uh, to make this a little bit more concrete, I'll give, I'll give you a, a sort of real world example of where this could be useful. Um, so the congressman this morning mentioned uh, uh, that um, you know his understanding was that temperature had an impact on transmission rate. Um, and this is one of the studies that is very often referred to when people, people say that temperature and, and humidity uh, seem to reduce transmission. Uh, but this paper was, done, was, was uh, written on 100 Chinese cities. Uh, that is a very, very small analysis. Um, whereas somebody in our community has taken every single city in the John Hopkins University data set, um, joined that city to the nearest weather station. And so he has, in doing that, has, he has created a data set um, um, where you could very easily or re relatively easily analyze uh, the, the link between temperature, fertility, fatalities and cases um, across across every, you know, the, the four or thousand cities or whatever number of cities it is in the John Hopkins data set. And so this is a data set mm -hmm. currently sitting on our website uh, that would allow somebody to build a much more robust model around the connection between temperature and, uh, um, and, fertil and uh, transmission rate. Um, so to conclude, for those of you who are machine learners who are looking for a way to get involved, you can check our challenges at Kaggle.com forward slash COVID-19. Uh, for those of you who are interested in following either the automated literature review, uh, the things that come out of the forecast, the, you know, anything that insights that come out of the forecasting challenge or the data sets being created on Kaggle, uh, visit Kaggle.com. Uh, forward slash COVID-19-contributions. We're also interested in getting input from uh, domain experts. Um, we found that having uh, domain experts help to steer the work of our community has been very helpful for producing more impactful results. So I encourage you to email me at a at kaggle.com. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anthony. Uh, that's a great and inspiring, uh, inspiring activity where people of many hands are working together. Our, our next speaker is Ron Lee. Uh, Ron is from Stanford University, and he will be talking about machine learning enabled systems for delivering care to critically ill patients. Thanks, Russ. Thank you to the organizers for this conference, and thanks to all the audience members who are joining us today in this uh, time of unprecedented crisis. I, my name is Ron. I'm an inpatient physician at Stanford Hospital, and I take care of hospitalized patients with COVID-19. I also work closely with the hospital and the School of Medicine to enable the use of AI to help address the most pressing clinical and operational problems that our healthcare system faces. Today, I'd like to share some work we are doing to use AI to help deliver care to our sickest patients with COVID-19. Before I get into the AI work, I'd like to start by just framing the problem. The reality is that um, there are clusters of COVID throughout the country, and the numbers today reported over 200,000 cases and over 4,000 deaths. The consequence of these rapidly growing numbers is the severe strain that's being placed on our country's healthcare systems. Resources are being drained, staff are under immense amounts of pressure and stress, and we are unfortunately already seeing healthcare workers getting ill with some who have already died. We need to fundamentally rethink the systems of care to meet the unique challenges we, meet, uh, we face with this pandemic. We are in a war and we need a wartime strategy. The key point I'd like to make here is that while we think about the individual goals of preventing outbreaks, delivering high quality care and keeping healthcare workers safe, we have to recognize that these goals are actually all interdependent. So the solutions we develop to control the COVID-19 pandemic will have to consider this interdependency and the complexity that comes with it. I'd like to get a bit more specific when we say that healthcare is complex, because what we really mean is that healthcare is delivered via complex systems and we can build better systems to deliver better care. I think this framing is important because it allows us to define the space in which we develop AI solutions. Traditionally, we mostly think of AI as synonymous with machine learning. But I think that for AI to truly drive solutions for the most pressing problems like the COVID-19 pandemic, we have to think about how to develop entire systems, including the structures, the processes, and patterns of care delivery that can be enabled by machine learning models. Here's an example of a process that we are using at Stanford Medicine to do this. We start by actually pretending that AI doesn't even exist because we focus uh, solely on understanding the problem that we are trying to solve. We also ensure that the process is highly multidisciplinary and iterative. 
The work doesn't end once the solution is implemented. In fact, it is only the beginning. Here is one problem that we face when managing patients who are hospitalized with COVID-19. Most patients um, admitted to the hospital are not actually critically ill in the beginning, and they can be managed in standard hospital isolation wards. If they become sicker, they will have to be moved into the intensive care unit or ICU. We worry about this population because, one, we're learning that many of these patients actually become sick very quickly. Um, we also have a constraint around the availability of ICU resources. And we also are learning that when we perform critical procedures like intubation, mechanical ventilation, um, these procedures aerosolize particles in uncontrolled settings. And that actually places healthcare workers at very high risk of becoming infected. So we came up with the problem statement of how can we identify sick patients early before they emergently need critical care? We started by using principles from process improvement to more deeply understand the current state. And I'd like to give special thanks to Margaret Smith for leading this work. We held focus groups and interviews uh, with tons of sticky notes, whiteboard sessions with frontline clinicians to better understand their current processes and pain points. We then prioritized each pain point based on how frequently it occurs and also its level of impact on workflow and outcomes. We then derive from these pain points the key drivers that can enable a better system for delivering care. And this is where AI comes in. Among these key drivers, we identified the need for accurate, objective, and timely clinical assessments that need to be continuously performed over time in order to screen for adverse patients. This is something that is currently performed manually by a limited number of trained physicians. And this is doable if we have, let's say, 20, 30 patients with COVID in our hospital, but becomes fairly difficult if we have several hundred. We recognize that this is actually a perfect task for a machine learning model to perform at scale. The model would have to pre uh, predict sufficiently in advance if a patient is at risk of requiring ICU level care. And there are actually many models out there that could do this well. And we ended up choosing one developed by our uh, electronic health record or EHR vendor because it's already, already conveniently integrated into our EHR and can drive the workflows that we need. Based on validation studies done by the vendor, um, it performs reasonably well in predicting the outcomes of interest. And the initial analyses that uh, the vendor has done, as well as us um, and our team at Stanford, suggest similar performance on COVID-19 patients. And we are actively validating as we have more patients at Stanford with COVID-19. In addition to validating the model in terms of prediction accuracy, I'd like to stress the importance of validating also the usefulness of the model output in enabling the workflows that we are designing. This is being done in design sessions that we are holding with frontline clinicians at Stanford. Here's an example of a digital interface in the EHR. Um, I'd like to thank the Stanford Healthcare Technology and Digital Solutions team for rapidly designing and building this out. Um, so let me point a couple of features here that I think are interesting. Um, one, you see a score, so it's 61 right here, that it ranges from zero to 100. So this score is calculated by the prediction model and it indicates the patient's level of risk of uh, becoming very ill and needing ICU level care. And this score is actually updated every 15 minutes based on the most recent clinical data. What you don't see that's blurred out here is actually also a section that shows the factors or the model features that, that most strongly contributes to this score at this time. One the minute. other thing is we, the, the score trend line. Um, and I'd like to point out that, so this is actually um, from a COVID patient in our hospital. And we noticed during these design sessions that there is a potential importance of not just the absolute value of the score, but also the rate of change. And you can see that in the beginning, the score is fairly low, and then it jumps from about 30 to 50. And you can imagine that is more important than just knowing what the score is at any given time if it's stable, because that can trigger certain workflows that, is, that are important for early detection and intervention. And we can also leverage the other IT capabilities we have available at our hospital to deliver this to clinicians. So armed with this prediction model, with information that is objective, reliably updated, and made available to not just the physician, but the entire clinical team, we can now ask, what new structures, processes, and patterns of care can we enable? What new roles, team dynamics, and cultural changes around care can emerge from a system that is enabled by AI? 
We are excited to find out as we are actively working on designing and implementing such a system to fight the COVID-19 pandemic at Stanford Medicine. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Ron, and thanks for your work. Um, our next speaker is Fei-Fei Li. Uh, she's at Stanford University, and she'll be talking about AI-assisted elderly care for acute infection and chronic disease. Everyone, it's really a true honor to be here to share some of our uh, research thinking on how we can help our aging population to cope and combat the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Our research is still very preliminary. We've spent the last several years looking at how a set of AI technology could help aging seniors to live more independently and cope with chronic disease management. But recently we realized the same technology for longer term care might also be helpful for seniors in this acute pandemic. And this is what I wanna share with you today. First and foremost, I want to acknowledge the researchers and uh, partner institutes. Our team is consisted of clinicians and computer scientists working closely together. The one person I want to highlight here today is Alan Luo, a second year PhD student at the computer science department at Stanford. Everything I'm presenting here is part of his current research. One thing that is most heart-wrenching when we hear the worldwide news about COVID-19 is the human losses and suffering. Here, a son recounted a chilling story of his elderly parents suffering high fevers at home in Italy for eight days before passing away with coronavirus without proper medical help. Indeed, while we still don't know much about the nature of coronavirus, one thing we're seeing from studies like this is that this virus hits elderly population harder than the younger ones, both in terms of infection rate as well as fatality. The red bars here show drastically increasing fatality rate as the age increases. Exactly why this is so is still subject to further scientific studies, but doctors and researchers are conjecturing several factors that might contribute to this pattern. For example, most seniors have base health conditions that make them more vulnerable. Community living of many seniors enable a faster spread of this highly infectious virus. Seniors also interact with caregivers who tend to be of a younger group and might carry the virus without symptoms. Other reasons may also include challenges of medical triaging or lack of care for the base chronic disease due to the overwhelmed healthcare systems. So one of the key questions all of us want to ask and find solutions for is how we can take care of seniors while keeping them safe. Well, nowhere is safer than home if one doesn't need to be in the hospitals. So how can we keep, help seniors to stay at home, yet help to continuously monitor early symptoms for infection or progressions of mild symptoms and or even continue to manage their base chronic health issues. A potential opportunity is to use AI powered smart sensor technology. The idea here is that sensors installed at home can help families and clinicians keep track of the health conditions of the elderly in versatile and scalable fashion. Here's how the system works in a four step overview. First is collecting data by putting sensors at home. This table shows various kinds of smart sensors. They complement each other in modality and the kind of data they capture, but also in sensitivity with respect to privacy. Camera sensors carry a lot of detailed information of a person's activity, but it's least compatible with most people's privacy needs. Other sensors include depth sensors on the second column, thermal sensors on the uh, third column, as well as wearable sensors in the last column. Since we're interested in understanding more nuanced and complex human behaviors relevant to clinical outcomes, our research focuses on the first three types of sensors. Now, in the second step, sensor data are transferred to some kind of secure central servers for machine learning and training. We need to address security issues in the transfer itself, but I won't elaborate here due to time limit. 
Then AI models are trained to recognize clinically relevant patterns, including respiratory, sleep, dietary, and other behaviors. These AI models can be then installed on the edge devices themselves so that in deployment time, data no longer has to leave the house. Last step is to set up a way to communicate the smart sensors detection results to caretakers and families. This is a quick summary of how this technology works. Now let's look at a few examples of the kind of useful information we could glean from these sensors. We show four examples, infection detection, mobility analysis, sleep pattern analysis, and dietary pattern analysis. Here's some sample images revealing fever detection or respiratory pattern recognition using thermal sensors. Such information is useful for early detection of infection. Here is an example of human movement understanding, an important clinical indicator for many relevant illnesses and something doctors would like to keep a close eye on. Using depth sensors that protect privacy, our preliminary work show high accuracy to discern different types of movements. Another example is sleep pattern analysis. Last but not the least, smart sensor technology could also reveal important information on dietary patterns from eating to fluid intake to pill consumption. One of the biggest pain points in our medical system in times like COVID-19 is the lack of caretakers due to a huge increase of healthcare system overload. These are just four concrete examples of, of how these sensors can help lending a hand to our clinicians in helping and protecting our elder population. They're not meant to do diagnostic decision-making or to replace clinicians but they can be there continuously to keep an eye on our aging population living at home and help to raise timely alerts to clinicians and families. Of course, for every step of this research One minute. and the deployment of this technology, we have to be very thoughtful of the ethical, privacy, and security challenges. We won't elaborate these points here, but we want to put them front and center as part of the ongoing research. So in summary, AI-powered smart sensor technology can provide an opportunity to help keeping our elderly population at home while helping our families and clinicians to continue to monitoring their health conditions. This is not only critical to help maintaining social distance of this more vulnerable population, but also helps to mitigate hospital overload. Beyond COVID-19, the same technology can help seniors to live at home with continuous assistance, can participate to help manage chronic conditions, and can also be useful for physical rehabilitations. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Fei Fei. And of course, it's great to see this system, which would be needed even without the COVID uh, epidemic and pandemic. So very inspiring work. Our next speaker is Bin Bin Chen. Bin Bin is a MD PhD student at Stanford, and he'll be discussing identifying COVID-19 vaccine candidates with machine learning. Thank you. My name is Bin Bin. I'm a recent PhD graduate from Ross Altman's lab. My previous research work focused on using machine learning to understand human immune system respond to cancer as well as vaccines. Thanks for giving me this opportunity to give this talk about our computation pipeline to identify vaccine candidates for COVID-19. Most of vaccines are dead pathogens or components of pathogens we can use to train immune system to get ready for real infection. We consider vaccine is one of the most powerful weapons against a pandemic like this. Not long ago, in 1950s, millions of Americans suffered from measles. Introduction of measles vaccines drastically reduced the incidence of measles in the US. Unfortunately, no vaccines are available for any form of coronavirus today. The key question we want to answer is that, what do we put into a COVID-19 vaccine? The short answer is components of viruses trigger immune responses. However, the field still has very limited immunology data on COVID-19 for today's talk, 
I will show you by combining immunology principles and the machine learning tools trained on a wide range of known pathogens, we can predict immunogenic components of a virus. How do our immune system fight off a viral infection? First, B cell can produce antibodies bind directly to specific parts of a viral protein. It can potentially stop entry of viruses into human cells. We call parts of viral protein to be targeted by a human antibody, B cell epitopes. However, what if viruses have already entered a human cell? Fortunately, human cells have machineries called MHC to present fragments of viral protein on their surface. T cells can recognize those viral protein fragments on a cell surface and destroy infected cells to stop viral infection. We call a viral protein fragment presented and recognized by T cell, T cell epitopes. Ideal COVID-19 vaccines should contain both B cell and T cell epitopes. Researchers, including our lab, have developed computational tools to identify these regions. This COPE-TOPE is a linear regression model to predict where antibody binds based on structure of a target protein. MARIA and MST pen are two neural networks trained on a wide range of pathogen data and as well as human data to identify the region can be presented by human cells based on their sequence features. So we can run these computational tools on a whole genome of novel coronavirus. The viral genome is a single RNA producing all pathogenic protein, including spike protein. You'll hear me talk a lot about spike protein today because it enables the entry of virus into human lung cells. Human ACE2 cells are protein present in human lung cells and tightly bind to viral spike protein. This interaction is essential for the virus to enter human cells. An antibody targeting this interaction will have desirable outcome for a COVID-19 vaccine. And I show the human ACE2 protein in yellow here. We first ran this code TOPE on the whole spike protein. The red region indicates the likely binding sites of human antibodies. We predicted the two top epitopes near residue 440 and 494. We ran the exact same computational pipeline using a structure solved by an independent lab and to predict the same epitopes. Further, this antibody binding site predicted sits between human ACE2 and the spike protein interface. So binding to this site is likely to block viral entries. Last week, Research in Shanghai validated our prediction using antibody isolated from COVID-19 patients. We did similar analysis for T cell epitopes of viral protein with our pre-trained neural network, Maria and the NAMHC pen. Blue colors indicates how likely this protein fragment can be presented by human cells. What we want to use for vaccines are regions with consistent dark blue colors. For example, here I show you this 9 MSC long fragment can be presented by 65% of common MSC on the cell surface. You can find more details in our manuscript online and we show our computational methods works well for historical SARS data. The last table in our manuscript summarize our top candidates for potential COVID-19 vaccines. Five out of 13 candidates are from spike protein. Some of our candidates not only look like SARS fragments, but also trigger antibody production in the previous SARS studies. In conclusion, spike protein contain both T cell and B cell epitopes. Anti-spike antibodies from patients likely block the viral entry. There are at least four spike protein center vaccine pipelines are under development. We will monitor closely for the clinical outcome of these trials. For researchers who want to go to beyond spike protein, we provide a comprehensive list of candidates for either vaccine development or understanding T cell response in COVID-19 patients. 
With that, I would like to thank all of your audience again, my team, my collaborators, and my funding source. Thank you very much, Bin Bin. Uh, we are all very much looking forward to the arrival of the vaccines, and we are grateful for the efforts of you and everybody else working on that. Our final speaker is Stefano Renzi. Stefano is a research engineer at Stanford, and the title of his talk will be Repurposing Existing Drugs to Fight COVID-19. Hi, Russ. Thank you for the introduction. Okay, so COVID-19 is a global pandemic that's already killed over 40,000 people, and it threatens to overwhelm healthcare systems around the world. Now, we desperately need treatments for it, but we don't have the five or 10 years that it normally takes to develop a new drug and get it into clinical trials. Now, the fastest way to develop drugs is to repurpose existing drugs that are already on the market or in clinical trials. The big advantage of this approach is that you can leverage a lot of work that's already been done. These compounds have already undergone extensive testing, and we know a lot about their safety. So if we have good reason to believe that they're effective, we can advance them into clinical trials almost immediately. Now, today, I'm going to talk about some work we've done using natural language processing, protein structure prediction, and biophysics to identify drugs that can be repurposed to fight COVID-19. So the first thing that we did was mine the literature for therapeutic targets. The goal here was to, to develop a working hypothesis. What protein are we gonna target? Why do we think it would be effective? And what evidence do we have that this therapeutic strategy would actually work? We did this using a tool that we developed in our lab called Doxtagraph, which uses natural language processing to generate a map of relationships between chemicals, diseases, and genes discussed in a corpus of documents. Here, the document corpus that we used are the abstracts from the top 15 articles returned by a PubMed search for SARS and all the articles that they've cited. The genes are green, chemicals are yellow, diseases are red, and the size of each dot represents its importance in the corpus. Now, the thing about the maps generated by our tool is that they also work as a content, content indexing system that lets you drill down on documents and even individual senses of interest. So when we click on this gene TR, TMPRSS2, uh, we get sentences that tell us that it is a host protease expressed on the surface of cells that line the airway. It activates a mild human coronavirus, 229E, by cleaving the spike protein. It has been shown to facilitate the spread of SARS and Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronaviruses in the airways of mice. So now we have a promising target and a mechanism of action. Right, this gene or protein, TMPRSS2, cleaves and activates the coronavirus spike protein, which allows it to bind its receptor, ACE2, and enter the cell. We want to disrupt this process by inhibiting the activation step. To do this, we need to find existing drugs that can bind and block the active site of our target, TMPRSS2. We decided that the best way to do this, given the available resources, was to use a biophysical biophysical model uh, to model the binding interactions between our target protein and potential inhibitors. So here, what I'm showing you is an ensemble of homology models that we generated for our target. Uh, you see the actual structure of the protein is currently unknown, so we had to use computational models to make predictions about it. And to do so, we used the known structures of closely related proteins as templates. So you can see here that all of the models align pretty well with a little bit of variability in the loop regions around the active site. Now here I've highlighted the active site of the protein. This is the part that catalyzes the activation of the coronavirus spike protein. Now we want to block this with a small molecule inhibitor. And here you can see a close-up of a small molecule inhibitor that is happily bound in the active site of TMPRSS2. And finally here, if you look at the dotted lines, these show some of the physical interactions between the active site and the inhibitor that keep it bound in place. So these are the interactions that we're gonna be modeling in our biophysics simulations. Now, the type of simulations we're gonna use are called molecular docking. And basically the way this works is that you take a potential inhibitor and you jam it into the active site, and then you look at how well it fits as well as the number and strength of physical interactions. Doing this, you can use some principles of physics to calculate the binding energy, which indicates how strongly that potential inhibitor is going to bind the active site. So we did this for 18 molecules in total. Three of them were designer chemicals that are known to be very potent inhibitors of TMPRSS2, 
and we use these as positive controls. The other 15 were our most promising repurposing candidates. So this slide here shows the results of our docking simulations. Um, the horizontal x-axis shows the binding energy. Negative scores, so things on the left side of this graph are good. They indicate tight binding. Each entry on the vertical y-axis is a compound, and the box and whisker plot associated with each compound shows the distribution of binding energy scores from docking simulations. So here we've highlighted the three positive controls in red, and they all rank very highly, which is good because this is what we would hope to see if our simulations are working properly. We also see that some of our repurposing candidates, which I've highlighted here in green, have binding energy scores approaching the positive controls, which suggests that they can also be potent inhibitors of TMPRSS2. Now, out of these top six candidates, three of them are currently marketed, meaning that they've been approved for use in humans and they're being prescribed to patients for other things. The other three are not approved, but they've made it pretty far into clinical trials. So while they're not available for prescribing, they've already been cleared for testing in humans. Now, as it turns out, this candidate here that I've highlighted in red that we've predicted to be a potent inhibitor uh, was reported to inhibit entry of the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus into human lung cells, and it's currently being tested in clinical trials in Japan. So that's pretty exciting for us. Um, one thing I would like to make very clear is that these are preliminary results. When you look at the hierarchy of evidence, uh, computational predictions are pretty close to the bottom. You can use them to figure out what experiments you should do in cells and mice, but it would be very irresponsible to test these compounds in humans without further experimental validation. That being said, we're very excited about these results and we're currently testing our candidates in cell models. I would like to acknowledge the organizations that fund my work as well as my co-authors, current and former lab mates, and a long list of researchers at other institutions who I've had the pleasure of working with. Thank you very much. And uh, if there's any time left, I would be happy to take a question or two from the moderator. Uh, Rob, I just, uh, we have a tradition now. I'd like to know if you'd like to ask the first question. Yeah, please, well, I, I'm gonna take up the mantle of uh, the kind of lay person uh, amongst this, this uh, otherwise pretty technical panel, uh, appropriately technical, unapologetically technical. But since <laughs> I, my disciplinary training, as I've mentioned already, is as a philosopher, I have a little bit of social science chops. I, I wanna ask a lay person's question for the AIML community um, that's assembled, especially on this panel. And it has to do with the following observation, I don't think especially controversial, which is that um, the amazing power of AI and machine learning is to find these patterns, uh, un patterns that humans would not be able to pick up on their own in enormous pools of data. Um, and one other way to put this is that uh, whatever the outputs or predictions are of some type of uh, uh, machine learning tool, is um, um, based upon the, the past, based upon history, based upon the data that's in the training set. And of course, COVID-19 is something novel. Um, what gives a machine learning expert, um, a, you know, someone doing the, the, the computational work here, the confidence that these particular tools which are generating predictions on the basis of the past will continue to be as powerful and as reliably predictable when it comes to confronting the novel coronavirus. Anthony? Uh, Anthony? Um, I think there's limits to, I, I think that machine learning can be useful in places and is not going to be terribly useful in places. So um, it's going to be useful um, if we want to study, for instance, like one of the projects we're doing is trying to figure out um, based on um, where we are today and differences in transmission rates up until this point. Um, uh, machine learning is, yeah, has the potential, I think, to be very good at picking that apart. However, if there is a policy lever that hasn't yet been applied and it gets applied next week, uh, machine learning is going to be pretty much useless in figuring out the impact of that policy lever. Um, and so I think your observation is spot on. Um, and really what it what it points to is the places where machine learning can be helpful and can't be helpful in, in the, the, the battle to get on top of COVID-19. Ron? That's a great question. And I can offer a clinical perspective as we're trying to use machine learning for clinical care. And it's true that we 
well, we don't have too much experience with COVID-19 patients, although we're finding that we're rapidly gaining experience, unfortunately. Um, but I also think that as a clinician, I also don't have experience treating COVID-19 patients outside of the few weeks that we've you know, treated them. And we also are finding that they are, yes, different, but not that different from other patients who are very ill. So I think what we're starting to see is, yes, we have these models that may not be perfect in predicting specific outcomes among COVID-19 patients, but they're good enough. And the benefit of having a machine learning model is that it also learns very quickly. It learns it can learn over thousands, hundreds of thousands of patients, when as a clinician, I can only learn from the, the patient, the limited patient population I see, and also that it can do things at scale, uh, something that uh, humans can't do. So I think we'll start to see these models getting better, but also I think we can't let the you know, enemy of, of good or enemy of good can be perfect. And perfect be the enemy of good, excuse me. <laughs> and I think at this point, we just our, our challenges are real. They're, they're here right now. So I think we just have to use what we have. Feifei? Yeah, so first of all, I want to thank uh, Rob for asking this question. It's really important that we don't overhype any technical tools, and, and it is important to recognize the limits of uh, machine learning and, and AI in today's uh, capabilities. Uh, so our work doesn't directly deal with the disease itself, but rather human behaviors that is in assistance to clinicians' uh, care for, for our patients or aging population. But one thing I want to add here, which is a bit of a call to action to machine learning community, is that um, uh, there are many interesting and important um, uh, problems and cases where it is in, indeed the long tail events, the, the, the few shot learning scenarios, the, the rare event scenarios that are really critical. And having been worked in clinical setting for the past uh, eight years, uh, whether it's a, a fall detection for aging seniors or a spike in fever um, uh, in, in, in the long evening or, or a, um, um, you know, oddity in, in dietary pattern, all these tend to be small data events but yet with the right um, development of machine learning, where we're looking at few shots learning, we're looking at uh, long tail um, rare event on, uh, recognition, these are opportunities that uh, uh, technical solutions can participate in, in addressing these uh, issues. When you say few shot learning, just to clarify, you mean examples where we've only seen a few pieces of data versus tons of data and yet still need to learn. Yes, thank you, Russ. So um, we do have some great questions from the uh, from the uh, audience. So uh, actually, for Fei Fei, uh, there's a lot of excitement about your models, and people want to know: Are they being deployed right now? And is there a way for them to validate how well they work specifically for COVID? Kind of building on the last question in some ways. Yeah, thank you. So what I presented is a set of uh, basic science research that has been going on at Stanford in collaboration with our medical school. And uh, uh, from a research point of view, we are focusing on writing academic papers and, and, and getting the, the academic uh, projects going. But I'm aware that um, there is actually um, um, Stanford spun-off uh, entrepreneur opportunities that is actually using the published work we have done and, and, and uh, uh, deploying similar um, te technique in uh, COVID, um, in, in COVID um, um, pandemic uh, situations globally now, internationally, and helping hospitals to combat, um, say, PPE gearing issues and, uh, and patient monitoring issues. So I'm aware of this work and we can take some of the specifics offline, but uh, this, is a, uh, this is a very good example of uh, basic science research ramping into um, real world application in a time of crisis. Let me just say, Feifei made reference to uh, offline. We will continue to update our resources page for this conference so that papers and uh, websites that might not be on there now that come to our attention during the meeting will be added in the coming days. So it'll be hopefully a living resource. Another question uh, for Kristen is, um, you, you showed some really interesting uh, data about the genome and its mutation uh, over time. Uh, is there any prospect for linking those muta mutation data with clinical data so that you can tell if some variations are more, uh, you know, severe than others and, and, and that kind of clinical genomic correlation? Uh, yeah, that, that's an excellent question. Um, most certainly. So in, as it relates to the functional genomics platform, 
Um, we really focus on the, gen the genomic information. Um, and as far as the clinical metadata, that's something that, of course, has tremendous patient privacy on, right? Um, but there are initiatives, for example, the GIS AID, who do aggregate that information, and we provide the unique identifiers to link out to those type of references. Um, and that way, um, individuals in their research portfolio can say, okay, um, I'm looking at specific trends in regionality, in age, and some of these different patient metadata attributes um, and link into that as well. Um, as it relates to what we are able to provide to the community because of the sensitivities around patient information, we don't redistribute that information, um, but it does exist in the public space where people can then link out. And the other question, just as an add-on that came in, was a question about whether any of your code uh, or data uh, at the genomic level is available for sharing and collaboration. Yes, it very much so is. Yeah, so if you look at ibm.biz slash functional dash genomics, and I can add that to the body of resources that you're um, putting together, yes. um, we have a public landing page. It has some description on there of the um, of the data itself. Um, we have some example code notebooks on public GitHub and those type of things, and we want to open this to COVID researchers and um, you know, having data that sits inside a bunch of uh, a bunch of walls doesn't help people. Um, and so we want to get this out to the community and really help accelerate research um, at an unprecedented time of a, a huge global health um, challenge. Great, thank you. Ron, a question came in for you. Uh, could you address the ethical issues of machine learning based triage for treatment access and resource allocation? Uh, it was mentioned in some of our earlier sessions, but it sounds like this might be something that you're dealing with head on. That's a great question and a tough one to answer. <laughs> I think that, uh, I mean, people are reading about stories, right, in Italy and now unfortunately in New York about even ra things like rationing ventilators. I mean, fortunately, we don't have that situation here. And I think the what we have to be attentive and careful about is well, the systems we're designing are very much human driven, but augmented by artificial intelligence. So as physicians, as other healthcare professionals, we kind of take on the responsibility of navigating through these challenges because they're so complex. I mean, unfortunately, I don't think at this point I would trust a machine learning model to make these high stakes decisions without human input. So um, it, it has to depend on the situation, but that's exactly why we're designing whole systems of people, of teams, and machine learning models, rather than having any kind of, you know, automated uh, triggering of, of, you know, critical decisions with just a model itself. Great, that makes perfect sense at this point. Bin Bin, it's, this is a little bit related also to the question we asked Kristen. Mm -hmm. uh, for vaccine development, how do we monitor viral mutations to make sure that our vaccine remains valid, even in the setting of uh, mutations over time of the virus? Uh, I think it's very really relevant for any vaccine development because um, viruses are different. If we talk about influenza, it will be irresponsible for me to not talk about mutation in my talk. Uh, let me see if I can share my slides. Um, for, can the audience see my slides right now, Russ? Yes, I believe we can. Um, so fortunately, thank you. Fortunately, uh, coronavirus, its own RNA polymerase is reasonably stable as they have proofreading abilities. So mutation rate are relatively low in the sample we saw. So um, most of patients only carry zero to three mutations compared to reference. So our lab design analysis um, first in February, in the important spike region, we see almost no mutation. Then almost two, month, uh, two months later, we only see like probably like 13, 14 mutations in the spike region intact with human ACE2. So we have certain confidence if we have a vaccine, it will cover most of people, specifically for spike protein. And another idea um, we are floating around is like, maybe we should be collecting samples from the community so you can check the mutation profiles in real time. Thank you, thank, thank you. you. Um, Stefano, a question came in uh, on your slide with all of the whisker plots. It looked like the error bars uh, in your plots were pretty wide. And so the question is, why are they so li wi wide, uh, for, especially for the repurposing candidates where it might dip into the range where you're not so excited about it? 
Yeah, yeah. So I would say that there's actually really one uh, protein, one homology model that caused a lot of the outliers. And this one in particular was a little bit funny because um, the template structure we used was bound to a very abnormal ligand. And this ligand actually changes the binding pocket when it binds in there. So it looked very different from anything else. And uh, it was somewhat of an outlier. And that's where a lot of those came from. Great. Um, this is a question that was originally focused to Ron, but I think you may all have ideas about this. Um, we've heard in this session and also in the previous sessions, Ron, about a lot of people volunteering to help, a surge, if you will, of technical skill and enthusiasm. Uh, the question is, has that been useful to you? Do we still need people to volunteer? And if we do need people, and this is for all of you, what areas do we really need people to step up who have specific expertise that might be useful either in your work or in the work that you know about? We'll start out with Ron, but I'd love to hear from all of you. Thanks, Russ. Um, well, I certainly can't speak for the entire medical community, um, but I, I will <laughs> say we, we certainly have witnessed a, a tremendous you know, number of volunteers. And I think this is a testament of crisis actually invoking good, right? I think things that we haven't really done before and invoking a sense of solidarity that really means a lot to us as frontline healthcare providers. But are the volunteers, is it easy to manage them and figure out how they can help? Because there's a certain overhead just in dealing with a, 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 a volunteer and you have to make sure that the time it takes to get them up to speed is worthwhile compared to the other things you could be doing. I think it has to be problem driven. So, you know, I think the, the healthcare organizations of Stanford Hospital, they've done a good job setting the, the key priorities. So for example, the PPE shortage, right? So we've had actually an inflow of volunteers from medical, including medical students, members of the community to source PPE. Um, I know Nigam Shah has created a data science group and many students have volunteered for that effort. Um, so I would say that volunteers are great. I think we, we certainly welcome help, but I think it is also our responsibility as health organizations and others on the front lines to set the priorities, to find the problem. And I think then the volunteers will come and we'll be successful together. Fei Fei? Uh, yeah, thank you for asking that question, whoever in the audience and Russ. Um, I, I would really like to call on the worldwide AI computer science technical talent to um, be interested in participating in healthcare research. We've been doing this for the past eight years. What I find is that, you know, in my own group, we have both basic science AI and health, AI and healthcare, and it's much more easily to get students interested in, in so-called normal AI, computer science AI, compared to students interested in healthcare and AI. But there we get we get to solve so many of these really global, important, sometimes acute like COVID-19, but sometimes just long-term human problems. And we really need that global talent of machine learning um, uh, students, uh, AI students to participate in us. Stefano, you made a bunch of computational predictions, uh, which are great, but as you pointed out in your talk, they require the cellular and the animal models. Any movement, has there been any uptake of your predictions in, in terms of moving them forward and evaluating them? Yes, so we are collaborating with several different labs on validating these predictions. Um, we have somebody who's doing direct binding assays for TMPRSS2 with a bunch of these compounds. So this isn't necessarily a cellular assay where you're measuring the effect on the cell, but we're directly measuring the binding of these agents to the protein. And then we are also collaborating with some labs that are doing cell entry assays where they're testing to see if these compounds are able to inhibit the entry of the virus into cell models. Great. Um, there's a question from the audience about whether um, are we making sure that we, uh, in a, for these uh, interventions for predicting, detecting, and understanding the distribution of interventions, is anybody making sure that the things that we do are not actually harming? There have been cases in history of medical interventions that we thought were good, but turned out to be bad. Um, I don't know if I've heard about any yet, but, um, but I'm wondering if any of you have uh, seen signal in that regard. Silence would be good in this case. Oh, Ron. Well, I, I won't say that I've seen signal of things harming, but I will say that the types of studies, especially in my area where we're implementing machine learning models, I think you'll see types of studies that go beyond just looking at model performance, but really looking at the implementation effects of the systems. Um, I mean, there is the whole area of implementation science that 
um, I think will be really important here. And we'll have to look at not just clinical outcomes, but how these interventions affect teams, culture, workflows. It's very complex, but I think altogether, this will help us understand what actually happens in vivo, if you will, when you have an AI system um, taking care of patients. Great. Um, let's see. Um, I, I don't know if anybody wants to comment on this, but the, uh, one question comes in. Some news sources are reporting that uh, countries that use the BCG vaccine, this is a vaccine that is uh, used to prevent uh, and provide protection against tuberculosis. Uh, that it is not routinely used in the United States, but there are some reports that the BCG vaccine may be um, helping lower COVID-19 infections. I don't know if anyone has anything to add about that. Uh, Bin Bin? So one sentence summary is no one really knows. There are actually clinical trials running among healthcare workers to see if BCG vaccine can protect them. But there's like way conclusive data on this topic right now. But one thing I want to cautious is this study suggesting different brand of BCG vaccine, depends on where it's manufactured, affects uh, the, the outcome. So we will like, if there's new paper come out, you should like take a grand thought about where the vaccine is manufactured. One question I wanted to ask Anthony is, um, it, and, and, and related to the Fei Face comments a moment ago, it is quite inspiring to see the computer science AI community throwing themselves uh, at the Kaggle challenges. But if I remember correctly, at the very end of your talk, you made a call for some domain expertise. As I recall, you wanted some healthcare people, and I can't remember the categories. Um, tell me about uh, the challenges in getting people who have skills in one area to make sure they're asking the right questions in a new area. Uh, and, and tell me why, why you're asking for those, those experts and what you're going to do with them. Yeah, for sure. So we've had a, um, uh, a small number. When the um, first challenge was launched, we had a bunch of people um, with public health and epidemiology backgrounds um, jumping into our forums. Um, and that has um, had a really large impact on focusing people on um, uh, some of the right, um, on solving more useful problems. So I'll give you a concrete example. Um, our um, this automated literature review is turning up lots and lots and lots of papers and um, and very often with con conflicting results. You know, the incubation, the average, the mean incubation period ranges from three days in one study through to seven days in another. Um, um, you hear of incubation periods up to 33 uh, days long, like how do you know which study to trust? Um, and, uh, and so... Um, uh, um, there's a particular epidemiologist, her name's Savannah Reed, who's been very active in the forums, who's been um, educating our um, community on uh, the levels of evidence uh, that are typically used in, in uh, medical studies. And so now people are um, mining the papers, not just for the conclusions, but also for what level of evidence the paper was based on. Um, the net, another big focus is uh, mining the papers for how large the sample sizes are, for instance. So if the, the evidence is a randomized control trial, how large is the sample size? And so this automated literature review is going from just dumping out the results in a fairly, you know, in a way that is sort of hard to to figure out which studies do you pay more attention to and which do you pay less attention to, um, to um, presenting results in a way that they are going to be more useful to those uh, making decisions. And that's what, that's, I give that as one example, but there are so many ways um, where uh, people with domain expertise like uh, Savannah have been useful. And, uh, you know, my pitch is that um, a single, uh, uh, you know, a small number of people with domain expertise, we have probably over 10,000 people uh, playing with our challenges at the moment. Um, 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 a very small number of uh, domain experts can have a very large impact on what this community of 10,000 people end up focusing on and how useful their work is. Fantastic. Very, very useful. Very helpful. Uh, Stefano, as our drug repurposing person, uh, there's been a lot of questions on the uh, chat line about hydroxychloroquine and, uh, and other uh, remdesivir and a bunch of other repurposing candidates, which you didn't mention because you were focusing on the one protein that you've been working on. Uh, we also heard earlier in the day uh, at least one case of a couple that seems to have self-dosed hydroxychloroquine with very bad outcomes. Uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts about this repurposing enterprise and the trade-offs between not wanting people to 
poison themselves uh, and yet getting information out to the physicians about drugs that may be helpful? Yes, yes. I mean, that's a very difficult question, right? Because a lot of times you might have uh, something that you're very excited about and you want to communicate that to the scientific community so they can do testing. However, people will pick up on it and then they might start taking the drugs themselves. And these are untested drugs. So they might be giving them to sick people or they might be taking them when they're ill. And, uh, you know, they just might not work or they might have dangerous side effects. So a bunch of the drugs that I highlighted in uh, my talk, in fact, had some pretty nasty side effects like uh, hemorrhages and uncontrollable bleeding. Um, you know, so you wouldn't necessarily want to give that to somebody unless you were pretty sure it was going to work. Uh, one of the pains that we took uh, in our slide was to actually obscure some of the names of the drugs um, because we didn't necessarily want to get them out there uh, unless they've been tested and put that out there. And, you know, I think it's just a really tough issue. We also ran into this when we were publishing the preprint. We sent it into BioArchive and um, they did not want to publish a preprint that was based uh, for repurposing that was based on just computational evidence. Um, because they were worried about exactly this. And we ultimately had to go somewhere else. And, you know, it, it, it's just a very difficult issue. You don't want people doing harmful things and you don't want to be inadvertently spreading misinformation if your predictions are wrong. On the other hand, you also want to be able to communicate your findings to other scientists so that they can test them and vet them and find out if they're right or wrong. Can I ask a question in, in that general spirit, which is um, we sometimes hear about the FDA or other, other bodies which control um, research and trials, uh, IRB processes internal to universities, um, loosening restrictions in the face of the emergency. I'm wondering for any of you who are hoping to you know, go through an IRB for, for the coronavirus or you know, FDA actually deploy animal or, or human subject trials, What's your view on whether or not the current types of regulatory arrangements are, are right for the moment or not? Hmm. So I'll take a stab at this one. I mean, I think that we are in very extraordinary times. So, you know, we need something fast and, you know, this is an emergency. So there has to be some kind of allowances made to get these drugs to the front line very quickly. I think uh, for repurposing repurs candidates, um, they already have some machinery in place that lets you skip some of the preclinical work and some of the early studies that you need to do because these have already been done. So there's kind of some stuff that's been proven in this domain. Um, I see that Ron is uh, Ron, raising his hand. Get in and then we're gonna um, bring our session to a close. Okay. Ron, please go ahead. Sure, I, I just wanted to say that the existing structures, processes for testing drugs and clinical trials, you know, they're happening right now. Stanford is a site for remdesivir. In fact, our group is conducting one of these trials. It's happening all over the country. So I think things are happening. Um, I will say though that, you know, some of the lower hanging fruits that we can solve probably aren't even regulatory, but just process. I mean, running a clinical trial is really tough just because even things like how do you consent a patient um, can you consent a patient remotely, right? What IT systems can you use to do that? I mean, these are all very boring things, but you could actually make a huge difference in the speed at which you conduct a trial. So I think these are things we're working on now at Stanford and I'm sure at other places. And I think we'll see some, you know, potentially some results in the future. Okay, well, I want to, th I think this ends our panel. I am very grateful for all of your comments and talks. Uh, if I could ask you to please leave the Zoom in the most respectful way possible, <laughs> uh, we, Rob and I will go right into our uh, wrap up session. So thank you very much, panelists, and please feel free to leave the Zoom. Thank you, everyone. That wasn't my smoothest moment, perhaps. Okay. That was great. Uh, so, you know, we've had a, a, a long day and um, we, we've, we've learned a lot. Um, you know, I kicked the day off by saying something about how universities are notoriously oriented towards long time horizons. You know, we, we work in a way which is rarely oriented to doing something quickly tomorrow in the face of an emergency. And when these occasions arise, it's inspiring to see people um, from all across the university in different places with different, different types of disciplinary expertise, bringing that expertise to bear on, on, on an urgent problem. And 
I mean, I'll add that I, I didn't think that anything we learned today would, would yield actionable advice for anyone listening for what to do tomorrow. Although we did hear that wearing a mask is indeed possibly a recommended activity, um, um, even if you're asymptomatic, uh, even, even simply um, going out in public. So there was one very practical thing which people could do tomorrow. Um, if you, but don't use one of the N95 masks. Right. Use one of the ones that you, you know, make for yourself at home. And, and we probably should wait for the CDC to press submit on that. Correct. We want to, we want to look at the CDC. In, in any case, um, practical stuff is very often what, what um, you know, we, we will hear about from other trusted sources. And we've heard a whole array of different things today. Um, we begin with a health crisis. We also know it's an economic crisis. It turns out it's an information crisis. It's a social crisis. It's a political crisis. Um, there are all kinds of opportunities, of course, in crises. And um, by working together across disciplinary lines, um, bringing minds together from within the university and outside the university to tackle big challenges, well, that's the sort of thing which um, keeps me hopeful. And that's one of the main things I'm taking away from today. I totally agree. I think we saw that the image of universities as an ivory tower, while sometimes it's true, there are people who have jumped off the tower and who are in the fray. Uh, let me let me just, if, if I can, say a few things to close. Um, we plan to make this entire broadcast available as a recording, so if you missed any of it, don't worry, it'll be available soon. Um, if you're on our HAI mailing list, or if you registered for this event, you'll receive that link by an email when it's available. In the meantime, we'll post updated sections and resources about the information that we learned today so that our resources page should be a living document for the next few days or even weeks. Um, if you registered for our event, you'll be receiving a survey. Um, as many of you know, registration stopped for technical reasons last night. Uh, so for the subset of you that did get to register, please tell us your opinions on how we did and what was useful will be very valuable to us. Uh, thank you again for making time to listen about, to our research today. All of us at HAI uh, are worried about the pandemic and wanted to do something to help. We hope this was useful. Uh, we want to thank Stanford Video for its support. And really, from the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered AI, we want to thank you for your participation, and we wish you all the best in terms of your health and your safety. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.